Hello guys, my name is Diego Pacheco and this is a Java video. This is also going to be a computer science 101 video and we're also going to be talking about algorithms and data structures. Today we're going to be talking about Bloom filters. Bloom filters are probabilistic data structures. They were created on the 70s and the idea is that you can tell if an element possibly or maybe is in a set or for sure is not in a set. And you might be wondering why that's useful. That's useful for space uh, optimization. So uh, Bloom filters are used on Apache Cassandra, in Google Bigtable, in Apache uh, Edgebase, in Postgres to avoid disk lookups. Bloom filters also are used by Akamai, CDN, uh, to prevent one uh, hit wonders to hit the disk, right? Um, and uh, they're also used by Medium, for instance, to avoid recommending articles uh, that you already read. Uh, and they're used by many other companies and products like Bing, Squid Proxy, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, and many others, right? So I want to show you how we can do uh, simple um, Bloom filter algorithms in Java. But before I get there, I just want to comment that um, in order to, to Bloom filters to be effective, you need to have um, less uh, false positives. Of course, if you have a false positive, it's not a big deal. You end up calling the database anyway. Right, but the whole idea is to reduce that traffic and therefore gain performance uh, and even increase uh, reliability, I would argue, or availability. Um, in order to Bloom filters to be effective, it's all about error rate, and you have good hash functions that keep your error rate down or low, meaning you have less false positive. And sometimes people use one hashing functions or two hashing functions or three hashing functions. So uh, there's a sweet spot um, depending on the size of the array and the number of hashing functions. There's even folks that use machine learning to get that spot. There's some um, mathematical formulas you can use to, to grasp that. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to skip that part, but that's something you need to keep in mind as using production. I also want to comment that Guava has an implementation that you also might consider, but like I said, the implementation is pretty simple. What you need to do is apply some of these formulas. Just when you create uh, the arrays, you make sure that your error functions and your hash uh, and your size are in symmetry so you don't have as many false positives. But if you do, it's not the end of the world. You're right, you're just going to hit uh, the database. But, but the whole idea of this tool is that you avoid hitting this expensive hole. Uh, resource and becomes like a filter, right? That's why the word is Bloom filter. Okay, so enough background and theory. Let's see the code, right? So here I have a Java PLC. I have two versions and let's go there and see how they work. We have two, we have different uh, implementations, different hash algorithms I uh, want to cover. So let's open it. So here, as you can see in my idea, I have a Maven project. Basically, um, if we take a look here, you're going to see that I do not have any dependency. I'm only using the standard library, right? And I have two versions. I have version one and version two. So, um, in, and I also have some test cases I can show. So, um, let's start with a common interface, right? So, I have, a, I have this common interface called Bloom Filter of T, right? So, it's uh, generic. Uh, and it has two methods. It has add, which you pass the t type is the value, and it has mind content. So just based on that, we can understand how the algorithm is going to work. So first, you need to add the element on the set or on the array, and then you can verify if that element is there or not. Right. So that's that's how it works. Okay, so let's go on the first implementation. So I have this uh, dummy Bloom filter implementation, 
all right? And this implementation, this class, it implements uh, the Bloom filter for integer. And I have an int array, right? And I have what's going to be the size of this array. And I have a list of two int functions, um, which is a functional interface in Java, where we're going to have our hash functions. And I'm using this h1, h2, int hash um, object to build them. So if we take a look at my hash here, this class, I have two uh, inner classes. They are implementing the functional interface in Java to int function, where I have to provide the implementation of this method called apply as int, where I'm going to return, I'm going to receive an integer and I need to return an integer. So for age one hash, the function is going to do this. We're going to get the value. We're going to apply mod five, and that's going to be your hash. For age two, we're going to get a value. We're going to multiply that value by two. We're going to add three, and then we're going to mod five again. And that's our age two implementation. In my build method, I just create an array, and I add these two hashes there. Right. So for this Bloom filter implementations, these are the hash functions. Then I have a constructor where you just pass the size. Uh, this integer bit count different to one uh, is interesting. Uh, by doing that, I'm just getting uh, numbers that are on this scale, like one, two, three, four, five, eight, thirty-two, sixty-four, and now on. Right. So that's a clever way to validate that. And then I just get the size and I create a array of that size. Then the add method, what we need to do is pretty simple. So you're going to go over our hash functions, all right? And um, I explain why we are doing a for here in just a moment, all right? But um, let's get uh, the first hash function. So we're going to call that hash function. And the array of the position of the hash function, we're going to add one. So there's a couple of things we need to unpack here. So first, uh, we have this array that has X number of elements, right? And the hash function is actually providing a mapping for us. So given this value, the hash map, the mapping on the hash for that is this, right? And, and I'm calling this ha hash position. So this value, it's gonna be used on that position of the array. And um, I'm adding one. So in this algorithm, we just need to add zeros and ones. So by default, it's going to be zero. And one, it means we have something here. But you, you can see there is a for loop, right? And we're going to do the same with a different hash function. It could be any hash function. Like I said, sometimes folks even use three functions. Here we have two functions. So first time it run, we're going to run with h1. And secondly, we're going to run with h2. And again, we're going to have the same position with one. And that's for redundancy. And you're going to explain this when I go to the next method, right? So what you need to keep in mind is for every value we add to the set, we apply a hash function and we insert in two different positions, insert one, right? The position of the hash on the array, we insert one. That's it. Now, how we verify it that it might contain, and the reason why it's called it might contain is because this algorithm can have false positives, but never ever going to have false negatives. So we receive an integer value, right? And now we're going to have an array, which is uh, h1 and h2 functions. I'm going to have uh, i variable that are going to start with zero. And then I'm going to go over the hash functions again. So I'm going to call the hash function. And now the h1, a2 array of i that in the first case is going to be zero, going to have the result of the array on the hash position, meaning this either is zero or one. All right, and then we're going to increment i and do it again. So now we have h1 and h2 value, all right, and, that it can, and they can be 0 and 0, 1 and 1, 0 and 1, or 1 and 0. And what we want to do to say that it might contain is if both positions are 1, this means it might contain. In some cases, we're going to get one position, and that's how the redundancy works. So we have more hash functions, we have more chances um, 
you know, to be correct, but also we might have more false positives. Uh, and that's it. That's the whole algorithm, right? Pretty, pretty simple. We have um, 54 lines of code, but I have a bunch of uh, Java doc here, right? So it's, it's very, very short. Now let's look some test cases. So this is my first implementation. I, I have a test case here where I created a, a set or a hay with uh, uh, 10, 24 elements. I add the value four. I ask if it's four is there. Uh, then I have the one that add 10 elements and ask if these 10 elements are there. Then I have the one that adds five, um, but asks for six and six is not there. Then I have this one that um, it ask for 100 positions which are not there right and that one here i just trying to create it with the right sizes and here just trying to create it with the wrong size so if i run here you guys gonna see that all my tests gonna pass meaning that algorithm is working there you go so everything green everything working now let's go to the second version of the algorithm which is slightly different so let's start with the hashing. So now we just have one hash function, but the algorithm operates in a slightly different way. So my hash function, I'm using objects.hash from Java, right? And I'm basically hashing the value. That's what I'm doing. Uh, then um, let's go to my implementation. The implementation is slightly different as well. Now we have the simple uh, Bloom filter, which is not that simple. Um, so... Uh, we have a um, long array, um, and we have the size, similar to the other implementation. We also have a list of uh, functional interface to int function, which is going to be on our hash function. But here we're just going to have one uh, value. Then we have a constructor where we receive the array, the size, and the functions. Then there is a builder, just to make it easier and fluent to construct. Uh, this object, right? So um, we have the with size, with hash functions, and we have build it. When we build it, we basically um, create um, a Bloom filter with the size and with hash functions. And an interesting thing, the size uh, of this array is going to be uh, the size and we're going to do some left shift operations. Uh, these are unsigned left, uh, sorry, right, unsigned right shift operations, right? So this is going to be the size of the array. And you can see this is uh, three uh, operators here means right unsigned shift in Java, unsigned right shift in Java. I made a um, bitwise video in Java. If you want to learn more about bitwise, I recommend you look at that video. Right, uh, but this will fall down on this scale of one, two, three, four, five, six, one twenty-eight, etc. Right. Uh, then we have this function called map hash because we need to see. Okay, so the hash uh, is what position of the array, right? So we get the hash, and what we do is we do a bitwise and between the hash and the size minus one of the array. So we make sure it's within the array. Then we have the add function where we're going to do some funky stuff here. So for each hash function, we're going to map hash. So we're going to apply the hash and we're going to see where the hash falls down into the array. Then we're going to do this again. All right. So we're going to look um, for this position on the array. All right. And either the value of this is going to be uh, whatever value we have um, there, right? Or um, one left shifted with the hash. That's that's what's going on here. And it repeats if you have more functions, we just have one. So that's right. So might contain what we're going to do. We're going to do something very, very similar. So we're going to get the hash and then we're going to do this. So we're going to do the, the position of the hay, that's the hash unsigned right shift to six, um, bitwise operation, and one left shift to the hash. And if this result is zero, 
it means false. If this result is anything but zero, it's true. So, long story short, map hash is going to give you a big number. So, that big number, it means it, it might contain. If you don't get a big number, you get zero. And, and, and that's it. And this fancy thing here is just looking to have a zero there or not. Right? You have a big number or we have, um, um, you know, uh, the, the, the possibility of the value. So, it's not that complicated. It's a bit more fancy because of the bitwise, right? And uh, I have some unit tests uh, to prove that it worked. Very similar uh, unit tests than the other ones, as um, you can see here. And I just want to run, and you're going to see that it also works. And there you go. All right. So this is how we can do Bloom filters in Java. I hope you guys like it. See you next time. Take care. Cheers.